You know, it's a great thrill to be here. Let me just say a couple of things. Um, I lost my mother in uh, February, and uh, she drifted <clears throat> away on uh, a similar journey that we've witnessed in these four films, which are incredible. In each frame, they ask a question because the the subject matter really demands that we ask ourselves, where where are we? What What is us? And... Uh, Every wide shot of beautiful nature, you have to ask yourself as the films go on, where, where is that in me, those pictures? How could I lose those? And then this web of our friends and family and loved ones, where is that? Is that me? And, uh, and then, of course, as we learn in Anna, this last film, you know, it, we are not in our vocabulary. You know, we can have a perfectly remarkable vocabulary and yet, in a, in a sense, be absent, uh, as, as this film shows. Um, I think uh, we are dealing with, as David will mention, you know, not, not only a, an existential question of who are we and what is aging and what are we to expect in the aging years as we uh, can expect to live to 100 years old, uh, many of us, um, we are dealing with a public health crisis. We are dealing with questions about how does the brain work? Um, what of dementia is simply a warranty running out of the brain uh, past a certain set of decades? And what of Alzheimer's and dementia is a specific pathological disorder that can have a cure? And then uh, ultimately, what are we to make of the love and devotion and the existence that is represented by the caregiving, that is not to be erased. Um, even if we were to cure Alzheimer's tomorrow, the significance and importance of that caring and caregiving, as tragic and as sad as it is, is a part of life and is a meaningful element of life. And we have to capture and embrace and uh, uh, you know, make sure that we don't miss every aspect of what's going on here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here because David Schenk, of course, and I go back to a long uh, history of uh, journalism. And you know, years ago, we were in radio at National Public Radio, and um, you know, this was long before the internet and all that. And and I remember David, uh, you know, in the beginning, before you know, we all started asking in journalism, so what's the future of journalism? Because the internet's going to take all our jobs away. David made the really smart decision to brand himself as the Alzheimer's guy. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, it's been a boom business for him, obviously. He's done really, really well. Um, and even in his kind of witness protection program uh, beard and everything here that he's got, uh, it's great to see him, and I love working with him. And uh, Eric, uh, what a great film, an unbelievable Amazing. piece of work, and yeah, uh, yeah. Thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Thank you. So we've spoken, the two of us have spoken before, but let's try to, you know, uh, land on some uh, unfamiliar territory for the three of us. Um, let me just say, where did that narrative piece come from, the, the story of the life come from in Anna? So um, that actually came from her daughter, Diane. So, you know, I, of course, in the filming process, I just wanted to show the disease through her eyes and her eyes only. So I didn't want anybody else in the family. I just wanted to be with her. And, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's not an easy piece to watch. And, uh, you know, let moments sit so that if you have or have not dealt with the disease, you, you really, it's kind of in your face. Um, you know, as far as the poem, it, it, was, it was still very important that we tell the story and in that this essence of who she was is still captured. Um, and that was best told by her daughter. So her daughter, I essentially said, you know, write whatever you feel comes from, from you know, would come from her. Um, so she wrote this piece. She sent it. She lives in California. She sent it over to me. I thought it was uh, just really touching. It says, perfect. I said, so when you come in, I want you to voice it. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to, I'm not a voiceover. So you have to voice it because it has to, it has to come from you. So, you know, originally I tried like a, a professional voice and it, it just didn't feel right. It felt uh, sterile. And I wanted it to be raw because the whole piece was essentially raw. So, you know, I wanted 
her to really voice the this poem of Anna's soul um, with all the bumps that you know you would as a human being tell her story and so it was diane who wrote the piece and and she's the one who did the uh the voice how much reworking of the text did you do on the on the text the actual text of the poem the thing that she wrote nothing rework, nothing so it's no nope. so it, it was because literally she wrote it <laughs> here's what's amazing to me as i listen to it um it at a certain point in the text i realized that aside from some details the fact that her mother was i guess the, her grandmother was a native american um, right right yes. anna's mother was a native american it, but it was anna, it was the, anna, the, the the daughter's name is again diane 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 yeah, yeah. Um, aside from those specific details it's told in very general terms you could almost substitute anyone in yeah. there it's stories of children grow up yep. and the, the numbers of course are specific right and as I began to realize that, and I'm getting goosebumps now, it just, it just felt so kind of universal speaking from this human reservoir. And did she intend to do that? Because she didn't get into what happened to daddy, what happened no. to... No. I mean, yeah. the, the no, numbers she, and the stuff was very general and right. amazing. She literally wrote it, sent me the email, I read it, I kind of worded it as I played things raw. I'm like, I love it. You know, it... it part it told the story it kind of gave you an essence of the type of woman she was a mother a grandmother and at the same time it had this uh you know poetic feel to it in terms of life and an essence and a, a being um that i felt exactly was universal uh had a very spiritual feel to it and that was it i said i love it and i think it was two weeks later she was coming in um to spend about a month with her mom because like i said she lives in california um, and, and I literally just had her do the voiceover and that was it. There was no rewrites or anything and it just felt right. It just Th felt right to me. This particular time that I was watching it, I had this overwhelming feeling that this is the film that all of us want and feel that we deserve about our own life or for our parents. It's like, do, what a recap. I mean, yeah. it just, it just, as you said, it, I think I had that feeling because it was so general and but general but intimate in a way right it just it, it well you also you're you're by the end you're so rooting for her go anna to paris you know and <laughs> you just you kind of want to see the shots of her you know and and then you realize of course you're not going to get any of that right. and she's not going to remember any of that for you and the best right. that you do are those knickknacks and stuff in the living room right that suggest who knows what but, absolutely you know. and one of the things you know if it's in the idea of when i was editing you know, you got to understand, obviously, when you when you view and listen to her, it's probably you can't really comprehend anything she's talking about. But I can tell you what, in when I started filming, I'll give you an example. She always was holding the uh, the little Indian Native American uh, baby doll. So she would get very emotional, as you could see in one of the moments that I showed and she cried about the baby doll. Um, you know, when you're editing, you're kind of going over the same thing over and over again. And I would just I, I, I would say to my uncle, I would say, you know, I feel like she's like saying something. She would cry about the baby. She'd get very emotional. I feel like there's somebody in there like she's there, you know. And, uh, you know, now my uncle would just go, no, no, Eric, it's just, it's just the disease, honey. You know, he's she's not, there's nothing there. So finally, you know, when I talked to Diane, you know, I said the same thing. As I said to my uncle, I said, you know, she would get very emotional about this baby. I just feel like there's something going on. She's got a story. She's like, well, Eric, nobody knows this, and only Diana knew this about the baby, about when Anna was like eight years old. Um, again, they come from a big family, so her mom was, was pregnant, and uh, she had the baby, and a few days later, the baby died. So when Anna was little, she was expecting her baby sister to come home, and unfortunately, it was a very uh, tragic uh, situation for her uh, growing up. So my uncle had no idea. Anna never told. You know, they were married for over 60 years. She never told. It was kind of like, you just don't talk about it. Um, so when she told me that, and she's like, my dad doesn't even know. Nobody knows. Uh, it, it, it verified what I felt that, yeah, she's, she's, there, she's t trying to tell me right. about this baby. And it was like it, it's a constant replay in her mind. Um, as you can see, she was very attached uh, 
to this doll. So, you know, I, I think we take for granted. Um, there's little pieces, like I always felt like I, I would keep certain moments in there because there would be a few words or the way she saw them that I know she was saying something, you know, and I would let those moments linger where she would talk about her mom and she's just kind of in her own world and she's rambling, but you hear little beats and uh, little fragments of like a story that she's trying to tell, you know, that over and over when you view it a, a few different times, you know, it kind of comes out at you, you know, about the baby and her mom and, and seeing her mom and, and, you know, you just hear these little pieces. So I want to make sure those kind of were woven into the fabric of uh, the piece because I don't think with the disease that I, I think they're, they're in a sense trying to tell us something many times. And I really felt that way with her. Well, whatever the, the sense of intention is, and again, you were with her, so mm -hmm. I, I, I would make no judgment about that. <clears throat> in all four of these films, you see that there's a, a kind of reverse narrative going on in that, yes, we're telling the story of the end of a life, and we're in some cases telling the story of what happened before, which is, of course, a classic linear narrative. But inside the sort of Alzheimer's space, there's this point narrative where, what is that? What is that? What is that? And then it comes out, you know, in, in the case of the lullaby, mm -hmm. for instance, and in the uh, What Remains, Something Remains film, and uh, just these little artifacts and pieces, and you, you, you see them, and then what are they, and then you look for other clues, and, and again, you're always looking for, is this the clue, is this the, the key? Um, David, in your experience in dealing with um, families and in thinking about the sort of clinical dimensions of all of this, um, how are we to reconcile the need for a cure and uh, the the need for caring, the need for this caregiving experience to to make more understandable and benign and loving this caring experience? Because a lot of families, of course, are just terrified by what's happened here and feel so guilty and and as though there's no hope. Right. Well. You, you touched on it a couple ways with your opening remarks. I mean, the first thing is when Alzheimer's is gone, and I'm more confident than ever that in our lifetime, the disease as we know it will, will be gone. It'll be something much more like um, cancer or heart disease where you're, you're catching it earlier, ideally before the symptoms, and you still might be seeing some symptoms but it's not the disease that we see now, and it doesn't, it doesn't kind of get into those later stages, or at least if it does, it's way, way, you know, the, the many, many years later than it would have in, in this, as it has in history. And as far as, you know, having a lot of kids is not a symptom of uh, Alzheimer's. I have five. <laughs> Just a little worried there, the uh, five you, kids you, in the you, Eric's movie. There is no increased risk level. factor. Hey, thank you. I know. I just talk, personally, I wanted to ask. Uh, was, but, but for me, but, anyway. But what... Uh, the, you, as you as you alluded to earlier, when Alzheimer's is gone, um, we'll still have caregiving issues. I mean, we're we're all we're all still going right. to die of something. We're still going to be anticipating for ourselves and our parents, and if we get old, for even for our, for our elderly kids, what those final years will be like. So and that, what we'll need to to deal so with. So that. that brings really the deeper question, and that is how much of this initiative. And this whole question of focusing on Alzheimer's and evangelizing this question of we need to pay more attention to this is really coming to a deeper understanding of aging and to be more responsible socially about how we deal with aging both personally and in, in terms of how we are responsible for people who can't care for themselves. Well, I mean, an honest answer to that is that if we if that's part of what's going on here, that's fantastic byproduct and I'll take it but the honest answer is I'm much more short-sighted I'm thinking uh, you know you said earlier that I'm kind of in the business or partly in the business of helping people understand this disease better and just just trying to think of new ways for people to talk about it and and get past the stigma that's still out there and I, I do a lot of work for this wonderful organization Carol Alzheimer's Fund that that's sponsored today and and um, and 
obviously there wasn't a lot of science here today and you don't see a scientist up here explaining the disease. So what they do is very different. But my job is to help translate what, what they say about the disease for them and interview the scientists and help humanize that. And my job is also really, as I see it, to interact with as many artists and to pull them into this community if they're not here and, ha and, and encourage them in any way we can to, to make art, to enlarge the conversation in order to get the, to the cure, there's the short-sightedness. I just wanna, I just wanna do anything we can to make this conversation bigger because strangely, uh, even though we think that curing all a disease is just about money and the right science and everything, it's really about the national or international will. It's a political, it's a cultural thing. Do we have the will to stop this disease? And you don't get that will without the, the, the conversation and the ideas and the art that helps create that will. Well, give us some science and politics here before we go back to the uh, sure. poignancy of the films themselves and open it up to questions here in the audience. The scale of Alzheimer's does force the question of politically how, and America doesn't have a ter terribly good track record in broadly dealing with health care of uh, <laughs> demographics. Um, do you think if this vision of these films truly does evangelize the question of we need to be concerned about this and what's coming. Give us the numbers. Right. Um, you know, do you think we're up to the task of actually, you know, with the governance that we have and God knows right. what that's about? I think. I've, we've heard, we, you hear people giggle as you talk about yeah. the, the health care. Right. So, um, I mean, there's, uh, there's any number of ways to answer that question. There's the now political, you know, the today political yeah. answer. But let me, let me first say, we do actually have some very good news, and it's very rare that a day comes where you can say there's good news about Alzheimer's disease. Um, just a, a hand, just a, maybe two years ago, we were stuck uh, at the figure of about $550 million of federal research money for Alzheimer's disease, and we had been stuck there for a dozen years or so. It was insane. Knowing what's coming, knowing what's here already, and knowing what's coming. What's coming? Just, just to remind us. Well, what's coming is that we have about amazing. five and a half million Americans who have the disease now. Something like uh, 25 or 30 million Americans who are affected directly in those families. Obviously, you can do the math about how many people are in families. Um, the number is something like four or five times that internationally. And we're looking at a quadrupling of those numbers in our generation. And we're looking at healthcare investments and personal family and community investments on the order of uh, 20 to $40 billion, right? Oh, no, no, the number's no. much higher. We're, yeah. we're already, the estimates, we're already spending in all the different ways for, of, of care and, and medicine over $200 billion a year just on this disease. So that's real money. <laughs> even in the United States, you know, level. And that number is going to go up to a trillion wow. or higher if we don't do anything about it. If we don't get any sort of drugs to slow the disease down or push it off or, or, or cure it, uh, God willing, uh, the numbers are crazy. The numbers for Alzheimer's, if we don't do anything about it, bankrupt the entire healthcare system on its own. So it's crazy. It, it's crazy. Uh, just as an economist, you could, you could have no feeling in your body on a human level. And just looking at the numbers, you'd say, we have to stop this disease. Mm. We have to in our generation or we're, we can't do anything else. All right. So half a million isn't going to do it. Let me, so let me, 500, let me do the 500 million isn't going to do it. I, I started to say good news. The good yeah. news is we went from 550 last year or, or just, uh, just a little before last year, we went to 900. And there was a plan to go higher. And even though you've heard terrible things about what's going on in funding the government and Trump's plan to fund the NIH, somehow we just went to 1.3 uh, billion for Alzheimer's. We're on our way to what we should be spending on Alzheimer's. It should be two or three billion dollars a year if you can kind of compare it to, to the damage it does with other diseases. But we're getting there. That's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge thing. It just happened uh, a couple weeks ago, so. How does this film initiative open the door to a subject that is terrifying to people? Well, I, I, it gets people into rooms and, and hopefully we'll have a nice conversation later and then hopefully every person here, th there was a beautiful moment at the end of your film, Eric, where you say, you are now part of my life and mm -hmm. it's kind of like, there's kind of like a, and there's nothing you can do about that. You know, even if you don't wish to, to be a part of my life, you're, we're attached and and everyone who sees your film and these other beautiful films and all the films on our website. And, and, and by the way, another kind of short-sighted, very 
uh, very, very selfish thing that we did the way we set up this, this contest, as Eric knows, is that everyone who submits their films, and it's now dozens and dozens, and we're on our, actually on our third year of competition, dozens and dozens and dozens of films, and eventually it'll be hundreds, all the films stay on the website forever. We're starting a channel, basically, of Alzheimer's content. So what do I hope happens? I hope that every single person who's touched by these films in theaters or online has, has a conversation or two or ten, and uh, it, it gets families talking about how they're going to care for their, for their mom or dad coming down the line if they can see the beginning of that. It gets people to give a little bit more money to Alzheimer's research. It gets people to talk to their, their uh, you know, to the representative about funding on, you know, on a level that we need to uh, nationally. I'm Eric, in this era where um, film is increasingly a language of everyone with smartphones and the ability to bring cameras into very personal moments in people's lives. Um, did you find, first of all, for yourself, that um, the ease with which a story like this can be told with the technology that we have today can possibly send the message that people need to curate these moments in their own lives and people can have the capacity, even if they only show it to their grandchildren, to create serious narrative films that uh, celebrate the end of lives that uh, in another generation would have been like the baby who died never spoken of. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I, when I set out to do this film, it was just purely for myself and her and, and for Anna, for the family. Um, that was it. It wasn't, it, you know, my intent originally wasn't really beyond that. Um, so, you know, when I finished a film, I put it out online, and uh, it just kind of trickled through, and it started, it was, suddenly we're starting to get invited to film festivals, and, um, and you know, getting awards, and, and, and it was unexpected. And, you know, my intent, like I said, was purely to just, if one person was touched by, you know, her story, you know, my job was done. Um, and I, and I always feel like, you know, I as far as filmmaking goes, you know, I, I, I do want my camera and the lens to have a, a purpose that that's meaningful at times, you know, th there is the entertainment fun and the like commercials are good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. No, you know, and I do in my workplace, I mean, I travel and do commercials and, and so on and so forth. But then there's the other party that's like, I need, you know, your camera needs to have a purpose. Um, and yeah, and the technology is at our disposal. Um, you don't need a, a hundred thousand dollar camera anymore. You know, you can shoot it with your phone. Um, but you know, it's kind of a perspective for people to a window for other people to, uh, to see. And, and yeah, in, in, in that moment towards the end, I mean, it's true. I really feel that way with, uh, s film, you know, uh, be a documentary or narrative that, you know, stories just usually hang on our hearts for years, decades, and, you know, usually for the rest of our lives if it touches us right. Um, yeah, so I think, I really do think there, in a, there is a responsibility factor to it. Because I'll tell you what, the, uh, I told the story last time, um, the first film where he's going through the projector and everything, and that's kind of like replaying his memories. Uh, yeah, I... You can never take for granted the power of the story you're telling or how you're filming something or, or putting your story together and showing somebody. You know, and I think filmmakers sometimes probably might take for granted the power for which they're projecting. Because I'll tell you what, the first time we ever showed, so when I got done with the, the film um, festival at, at our town, Flickers, invited us to come and screen the, uh, the film. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, Anne at that point was pretty much catatonic. So I remember she came to the theater. My uncle brought her to the theater. She was at a nursing home at this point. So she, she came to the theater, and I remember she rolls up, and she's got this one little flower in her hand. And she was just, like, gone, you know, just catatonic. Um, so we took her in the wheelchair, brought her into the theater. So lights go down just like here, and suddenly the film starts. So I, I'm sitting next to her like this, and I just remember her eyes just 
looking up and watching. And I could see her eyes. Her eyes are just going back and forth, back, and she's watching. So I'm watching her the whole time, you know, just like totally entranced. So the moment her, her the, the scene with her mom where she's, you know, got the painting and is just caressing the, you know, hugging the painting, I, she gets up and she starts screaming, that's my mom, that's my mom. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know. Yeah. It blew everybody away. I mean, it was just is it, it was a moment where it just shined a huge light, you know, onto what I did. So the entire time of the film was going on, she was up. She was, I mean, aware. And every time her mom came on, she would scream and cry. I mean, she was trying to get up and stand. And then when the film got done, she was like aware for a few minutes, and then maybe about five minutes after, she just went back right back down. Mm -hmm. Well, it says, you know, again, filmmakers don't have total knowledge of the value of their work. Right. And as you say, it has neurological value in the brain Absolutely. of Anna. It has social value in the story that's told to uh, people like you here. Um, and, of course, it has medical value in that it's documenting the progression of something that we all have to deal with here as david says so we got time for a couple questions and and i also um want to end with two things number one um in the in the in the film oh, something remains i want you to comment on this the filmmaker deliberately creates this symmetry between the helplessness and the um uh, uh, kind of lack of consciousness, explicit consciousness of a in, of a baby going back in time, mm -hmm. and uh, someone with Alzheimer's going forward in time towards yeah. death. Um, it served the purpose of just uh, de. Um, I, I felt less scared and afraid of those moments towards death as I saw them compared to yeah. birth. Um, I thought it was, you know, it could have been a cute trick, but it seemed to work very, very well to make a much bigger statement. Absolutely. I mean, I immediately feel like this idea of the cycle of life um, with that particular film. And in terms of, uh, you know, I look at, you know, like Anna, unfortunately, I'm, I'm starting to go through with my own father with uh, dementia. And, and you know, I, I see them almost revert their their memories always go back to at least in my dad and Anna's case to this childhood they can't remember like my father can't remember something from three minutes ago mm -hmm. but he can tell you everything from when he was seven or eight years old and it's um very interesting i don't you know it, it so for me seeing that cut cutting back and forth that's kind of how i take it based on my own experience between anna and my father is like this this cycle of the cycle of life you know birth to death mm -hmm. but also this idea of how the memory plays perhaps with the disease unfortunately obviously we don't understand what's going on but based on my experience with family i feel like that does happen where they have this incredible memory of the beginning and and really not much in the going towards yeah. the end. David? We have a time issue. So okay, we, should, yes. we should probably try All to right, grab questions, questions here. and then they'll kick us out. Raise, raise your hands, shout it out, yeah. I'll repeat it. I'll, I'll get to you way in the back with the mic. Oh, we really only mic. have time for one mic. or two questions at most, but um, if people want to join us in the reception and continue conversations there, you're welcome to. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, Eric, I'm wondering about permission to do this and whether Aunt, who who said it was okay and how oh. did you feel about for i mean anna did not seem to be able to make a judgment yeah. if, well, I'm from i don't know what condition she was in when you got the idea right so anna is my godmother um so i just asked my uncle pat you know i said could i film you know anna and just show a story through her eyes and i don't want anybody else not you or the kids or anybody i just want to film her and capture what's going on mm. you know so he gave me permission to uh to do so was she living in that house when you were filming there mm -hmm. she was yeah that's a house that, i mean that's a house you know i grew up with memories as a child every week having these big powwows mm. um so yeah and now as you can see there's a sense of emptiness sure um but yeah another question 
it right down here. I can see. Well, you can see better. I, you can just shout it out. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it's it's a it's a good thing to ask about that guy because um, I, I'll tell you more in the, in the conversation uh, over wine. But that was Greg O'Brien. He's certainly able to give permission. Uh, he's at, he's in a very early stage of the disease. Greg O'Brien, if you go online, livingwithalls.org is the website. I didn't give it out earlier. Um, you will see not just that film, but a beautiful film by the filmmaker Steve James, who is maybe the best living, uh, best well-known documentary filmmaker of our time right now, uh, made Hoop Dreams. He, mm -hmm. I was able to, to get him with some earlier uh, money, an earlier part of this project, to make a beautiful 10-minute film about Greg O'Brien. Um, he's an extraordinary guy. He's... Um, uh, Steve wanted, uh, Steve and I talked about this for about a, a, a year and a half, and he kept saying, what I really want is I want someone, I had someone like that in my book who had the disease and could talk about it in, in the first person, not, you know, not in a kind of manufactured first person, the way you did it so beautifully, but in the actual first person. And, um, and I said, Steve, you're not going to find someone like that. They're, they're really hard to find. The disease takes that away from you by the time it, they're diagnosed. And they're very rare, but Greg is a, a rare bird. He's able, he's quite articulate. He's actually advanced a little bit, but I do want to tell the audience that Greg and I have started uh, recording podcasts. Uh, I haven't even told John this yet, but uh, we're recording podcasts once every two or three weeks. WGBH is going uh, to distribute it. And we have, uh, we've committed to each other, especially on his side and his family side. We're going to talk about his disease until he can't talk about it anymore. Wow, that's great. And, that's and, we're, and he's a journalist, so, so we're also co-hosts of this program. We'll be interviewing people like Eric and like you know, scientists. And so you're pitching yourself on my show, is what you're saying? <laughs> Absolutely. Isn't, isn't yeah, that that's, what I do that's every that's time we deal. talk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, <laughs> isn't right. that the deal? Right, but, but I'm surprised you couldn't find people who are in the early stages of the disease. If you go on up on Central Park West, almost everyone you come to is convinced <laughs> that they're in the early <laughs> stages. Like, yeah. I mean, the neurosis yeah. is just extraordinary. All right, last question before we uh, go here, or, or do we have to wrap, wrap it back up? Back in the black. Yeah. Um, uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm very emotional because I always say I live with this disease because of my husband. And I have been taking notes on him for the last five years. And until we find the cure, we need to document the disease and have conversations because the person is there, but they are no longer there. I always say I live with the person I love, but he's not the person I married 19 years ago. So you, I have learned to live in his world, to function in order to keep him home, but then I need to step out of his world. The fact that this collective document is what we need to do as a society is extraordinary. The other thing is the fact that you're living with someone with Alzheimer's and that you would take your Sunday afternoon and come to an Alzheimer's film festival. I have to say that is even more extraordinary, but uh, it's so beautiful. And not only you. that, I happen to know this woman is, is now letting herself being filmed. Her husband is a legendary jazz pianist and there's gonna there's a beautiful film being made i think the filmmakers are here as we go to the to the to the room with the wine introduce yourselves to people practically yep. everyone here is either a part of a film naomi Boke is here made one of our original films Fantastic. hannah ryman's here made a beautiful film for a contest people are either in films or making films uh or or they're a part of the alzheimer's world so you know let's it's one last question really one last question for, I mean, it's from me, but we have to because okay. we have to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, where's Anna? Oh, she passed away. She was yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She passed away in 2015. So 2015. A little bit after I finished the film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Eric, thank you so much thank for you. all of your work. Thank David, you. thank you so much, thank you. and thank you all for being a part of this community that's so real and important.